Hello, this is Daryl Castle with today's Castle Report. Today is Friday, the 24th day of July in the year 2020. Sometimes it occurs to me that what I am really doing with these reports I present each week is chronicling the actions of the insane people who seem to be in charge now, as well as the insane people who challenge that authority. Today, then, will be no different as I point out some of the insanity that jumps out of the news at anyone who looks or listens. Here at the Castle family, we're doing fine, doing our best to hold on to our sanity in a world gone mad. Each day, we watch the local government, and we hope that it does not choose to commit some act of insanity that will restrict our law firm's ability to function. The family daughter remains stuck at the bottom of the world and is restricted to watching the insanity by video. Some of the things which seems to be driving the insanity right now are the coronavirus, the lockdowns, other economic destruction it has wrought, riots, looting, anarchy, defined as a breakdown of law and order in the mostly Democrat cities of the nation. The breakdown seems to be fueled by the fact that the elected representatives in those cities and states often refuse to enforce the law, even openly side with the lawbreakers. When that happens, destruction of the rule of law is sure to follow. For example, the city center of Portland, Oregon, the Rose City, has been turned into a burned-out wreck years of street violence by Antifa. Now Black Lives Matter. Those years have finally evolved into more than 50 consecutive days of what amounts to violent insurrection. The insurrection includes attempts to burn the federal courthouse, attempts to burn the offices of the Portland Police Union, as well as many other public buildings. Portland's mayor, Ted Wheeler, Oregon Governor Kate Brown, and Oregon Attorney General Ellen Rosenblum have joined the insurrection. They're down with the cause, you see. Nobody seems clear as to what the riots are about or what perceived problems the rioters are protesting, but the authority in Oregon are down with it, whatever it is. I wonder if there are any law-abiding, hard-working people left in Portland who just want to go about their lives in peace. That is probably the case because every demand of the rioters, no matter how ridiculous, is quickly agreed to. President Trump gave in to the siren's call to restore order and protect federal property in Portland and he sent in federal officers. These officers have apparently been arresting Antifa leaders and riots, rioters off the streets of Portland. That was and is a mistake in my view. It is a mistake that cannot be papered over by an executive order. Not only does it violate the Constitution, but it's even a stupid political move. Mayor Wheeler does not like it one bit and demanded that the federal officers, which he refers to as Federal troops leave Portland immediately. Their presence here is actually leading to more violence and more vandalism, he said. I wonder how anyone would know if there was more since the city has been taken over, colonized, and occupied by a foreign invasion for months. I don't support the use of federal officers against the will of local officials either. But the reaction of the mayor to the loss of his city is interesting. I suppose that in his mind, Portland's sacrifice is just collateral damage. In the broader struggle, the officers were deployed from the Department of Homeland Security, the U.S. Marshal Service, and Customs and Border Protection. The executive order designed to protect statues and federal property in general, which requires that anyone who damages such property must be prosecuted. That order, according to the federal government, allows federal officers to operate, operate outside the permission of local authorities, but that view is dead wrong. U.S. attorneys in each district are there to investigate and prosecute federal crimes. If they will not do their job, they can and should be replaced. Oregon Senators Ron Wyden and Jeff Merkley are demanding a full investigation into the, quote, unrequested presence and violent actions of federal forces in Portland, end quote, they don't seem to be concerned about the breakdown of order as evidenced by the rioting, looting, 
They're only concerned about the presence of federal officers. History tells me that South Carolina once made the same complaint. I understand that as of yesterday, the mayor has requested National Guard troops to come into Portland to quell the disorder. We have a big government. Big government means big, unrestrained power. Big government means lots of power to ignore the legal restraints and do whatever it wants at any time. What would lead us to think that government would restrict itself to such things as social justice, equality, fairness, so on and so forth, no matter who is elected to lead this big government, strange, frightening uniforms, black sites, snatching of individuals off the streets with no due process, disappearance of certain individuals are often the result of such out-of-control government. That is why Portland's officials should keep in mind that a government strong enough to seize the means of production, which they advocate, from private ownership just might be strong enough to run your city from Washington. Up the coast, we have another form of insanity. More insanity in Seattle, it seems. The city council of Seattle recently, a meeting on Zoom, which council member Lisa Herbold proposed cutting the city police force by 50%. But that proposal is not even controversial anymore. The controversy arose with the way she proposed the cuts be made. Only white officers would be, quote, laid off. Officers of color, as she put it, would be exempt from any layoffs. The end goal of Seattle is to support the defund movement and end police presence in that city. Their goal will have deadly consequences, I predict, for their population. But the city council seems unable to comprehend that. Perhaps that is because when a council member calls the police or calls their private security service. They get an immediate response. Yes, Seattle's woke council wants to reimagine, rebuild with community-led organizations. But for the sake of the people of Seattle, I hope the violent predators are as down with the cause as their city council. In Chicago, as usual, they have a different problem. That involves Mayor Lori Lightfoot. She's lost control of her city. She's been forced to admit that although she camouflages her admission, but very badly. Last Monday, Mayor Lightfoot sent a letter to the President of the United States agreeing to his offer to send 150 federal agents to the city to help it cope with violent crime, quote, mostly peaceful riots, looting, skyrocketing shootings, and murder. What I mean by camouflage was in the rest of her letter the mayor went on to say that all things about how she was very reluctant. Later, she tweeted, quote, under no circumstances will I, allow, will I allow Donald Trump's troops to come to Chicago and terrorize our residents, end quote. Well, one hour and a half after her tweet, long before any federal officers could arrive, 14 people were shot at a funeral home in Chicago where they were attending a funeral for someone who had previously been shot, so the mayor's comment about terrorize our residents, I would reply that the street thugs of her city have done a fair job of that already. Today is the 24th day of July, so these numbers go through yesterday, folks. Yesterday, the 23rd of July, 459 people have been shot with 93 dead. This month, this very month in Chicago, we still have a week to go, Mayor. Maybe we can get to 100. So, Mayor, when your city is already a bloody war zone, how can federal assistance make it any worse? How could it get worse, Mayor? Chicago has one of the strictest gun control laws in the nation. I suppose that's why only seven or 800 people are shot to death there each year. Without that strict law to keep law-abiding people from defending themselves, I know it would be much, much worse. I guess when you go out to a funeral in Chicago, you dress up in your funeral clothes and you strap on your gun. That's part of your funeral uniform, I guess. It's not funny, though. It's tragedy. It's a disaster. It's an unsolvable problem in today's climate of racial hostility and total thought control. There is literally no way to even make a dent in this problem without admitting it's a black problem, not a white one. White people are not killing each other in Chicago. Black people are the solution then will obviously have more of an impact on black communities of Chicago than it does on the white ones. For those reasons, for constitutional reasons, for many other reasons, if I were Donald Trump, I would not touch Chicago 
or any other city besides Washington with a 10-foot pole, not under any circumstances. It's a trap, a trap he seems intent on falling into. Perhaps his instincts are that he can do anything. He can solve any problem. I mean, after all, he does have unlimited funds to draw on, so money can solve anything, right? No, that briar patch is a bad place. He should stay away from it. Just tell Portland, Seattle, Chicago, they can call on their own state national guard if they think troops are necessary. Mayor Lightfoot probably wants him to stick his nose into Chicago very badly. She knows what will probably happen. She can then say, look, I warned him, but he did it anyway. Look what happened. I'm afraid that America is at a crossroad. Crossroads in its history. Which fork in this road will be chosen? Which will be the road leading to peace and prosperity for the most people or the road leading to a house divided against itself, when two groups who desperately hate each other seek control of the same government but are willing to let that control be decided by free elections, a country can still exist if one or both of those groups will not allow control by election, then they are on the road to civil war. The federal government has plenty of insanity to deal with on its own right now. It's not just our own government in Washington either because governments around the world have gone insane at the same time the last semblance of fiscal and monetary sanity is gone from the world. The laws of economics have all been repealed, it seems. Everything, <coughs> well, almost everything, is getting a federal bailout, airlines, tourist sites, shale oil fracking, car manufacturing, even people, ordinary people, got twelve to $2,400 for free. Where is the government getting all this free money? The answer is the same one Franklin Roosevelt told the press when they asked him where the Doolittle Raiders took off from. Why, Shangri-La, ladies and gentlemen, from Shangri-La, he said. The real answer to where is the money coming from is thin air or blips on someone's computer screen. It is money because we're told that it is. We believe that it is, for now anyway. In conclusion, folks, there's plenty of insanity to go around right now, but both sides had better proceed with caution. This may be a historical turning, but war is not about rights, not about politics, not about words. It's about inflicting attrition on the enemy so that one side can no longer continue the struggle. It is not pretty or fun. It causes pain. It causes tears. What is the federal government supposed to do with problems such as those I have mentioned today. Make them worse, of course, that's what governments do. Making problems worse by trying to fix everything is what stupid, insane, bureaucratic institutions do. However, as Cool Hand Luke once famously said, sometimes nothing is a pretty cool hand. Finally, folks, the world has gone mad. As evidence of that premise, I offer the fact that inversely every elected office you look at all you see are insane men and women filling them they all compete to see who can be the most dangerously insane the christian underpinnings of this society have been ripped away destroyed all that's left is the darkness of human nature and the insanity that lies within at least that's the way i see it folks till next time this is daryl castle thanks for listening